get a song book and turn to page 692. 692. see where I laid it last, but it is good to have everybody tonight. Good to see everybody. Hope everybody's had a nice, cool day inside somewhere, because you didn't have one if you was outside. And I seen big, oh, thunderstorms and all that storms coming this way, but I think they're going to fizzle before they get here. I think we're going to get maybe a couple little dribbles, and that's about it. So that's what we want to see anyhow. And somewhere I've got a prayer list up here. Mind me things going on. Don't forget, be praying for our school. These teachers have been down here all week. They're going through training. They're working on their classes. And all three air conditioners on the fire building quit. So I was over there. I come over in there Monday night, and uh, the, it was 80 degrees. It's, the things were set way low, but it was 80 degrees, very sticky. That was in the cool part of the day. So that brother Price worked over there all day. That was part of the problem. So when he got out of there, I called the furnace man and the air conditioner man, and he come fixed it. So we're in good shape now. It's almost chilly over there. Uh, but they're all, they're all working. And all it did was cost a little money. And then um, today we had the piano tune man come, and that cost a little more money. Seemed like everything we do costs money around here. Uh, there is a, uh, some of you have seen it, a big, very pretty upright piano over there that was donated to the church. But when the piano tuner comes today, it's not fixable. So if anybody would like that for decoration, maybe to gut it, make a bookshelf or a bookcase or something like that, I have seen people do that. Uh, let me know. You're welcome to it. Otherwise, it will be headed somewhere. I don't know where. I may see it. I may have somebody stick it on one of them sell places to see if somebody just wants to come pick it up. It's very heavy. And I had no idea that it was going to be unfixable or we would never went all the way to their house and picked it up and brought it over here, but we did it. I hate, someone donates something, I hate to just say no because it trying to makes us look like we're, we're a little bit better than you, so I take it. I took another piano one time that 
before I ever got it onto the trailer, I could see it was just junk, but it was too late. I'd already said we'd take it, so we just brought it home and tore it apart. <laughs> it was just, it was nasty. So we did much better on this one. This was a donation. That is about a $12,000 piano. Well, it's more than that now, but, um, and a lady said, I want to make sure it goes to a church where, they'll, where you will use it. I said, I promise you, we will use it. So, and that is, that is our best piano by far. But we've got a bunch of them. If you've been thinking about Bob, if you've been, you've been wanting to sing a song and nobody practice, we've got a piano way back there on the far end. You can hide and sing and practice back there that way. Oh, <laughs> and your, wife, your wife's head started going sideways just as soon as you started talking. But you look at it, and if you decide you want it, I'll get some muscles and get it over there. <laughs> Well, now, see, it's storage. Once you take all the insides out, you got all that storage in there, and it's just, oh. <laughs> well, we better not get too much controversy started on that. Uh, but anyhow, that's, that's coming up. School's coming up. Pray for the school. We got a lot of young people, a lot of new families. Um, believe it or not, we've, the school has opened up a lot of doors to get families into our church and, and um, at, at least at least to come and visit and 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 I'm still amazed sometimes people will ask questions about where can I do this where, where's a good church for this and there's dozens of people that give us a good high recommendation I don't even know who they are they don't come here but they they like us and so I'm, I'm glad they like us and and one of them even said good things about me I almost called them ask them if they can send me a copy of that or something but <clears throat> but uh, it, it's out there. There's, there's people, they hear about us. They hear we're doing things, and ha things are happening in the QNOT is what they're thinking, so I'm glad for that. Uh, then uh, tomorrow night, if you'd like to come, we're going to try to get some more Bibles put together, and uh, we're doing a good job. Some folks have been stapling during the week, and they are on, actually Sunday afternoon, they got quite a few stapled, and did some, some trimming. I don't think we get any trimming yet this week, but we will tomorrow night. And so uh, if you want to come help in that, that'll start at 6 o'clock. We'll probably be finding some arrangement to move the table that's got all the books on it that's not stapled yet. We're going to have to give room so they can get to their lockers. I, I'll have to, we'll have to do some ciphering. We'll cipher that. We'll get an engineer look at it or something. But we'll make something work out. Uh, and... Just a little bit of good news. You've, I've mentioned before that we have four groundhogs that we can't get rid of, and he keeps feeding them, uh, what is that, mothballs, and I think they eat them. I mean, I just love that. They just love it. And the whole, you, within a hundred yards of his house smells like mothballs everywhere. And, uh, but on my way in today, out in the road lays one groundhog. He wanted to go visit the neighbors. And uh, I, should, I told him, I said, if you don't want to get killed, stay out here. As long as he's shooting at you, you're safe. But you get out in the road, you get run over. But we're down, uh, we're we're up down to three now, so we're not we're doing better. We we just got three groundhogs to go. I don't know if winter time if they hibernate. I don't know what they do. I doubt it. Let's see. There was more announcements. I had more things I was going to tell you. We got revival coming up, of course. Uh, this Sunday, this Sunday starts our new Sunday school classes, and everybody's nervous. Some, half of you is not signed up, but come to Sunday school. And uh, I think I think this round is like ten weeks, and then we'll uh, we'll be switching things around. I'm trying to get some of the uh, younger younger men and some of them teaching. So we got Brother Brian Walden in this time, but uh, you'll be stuck with me again in about ten weeks from now. We'll take back over, and and uh, I'll be back in here. And I don't know. I think maybe Matthew will be in this part of the, I'm not sure yet who's going to be over here for the next 10 weeks, but someone will be over here. And so there'll be classes here, there'll be classes in the junior church, and then the regular two classes uh, over there. And now it's been very hot over there the last few weeks because I think the air conditioner was already going out, but it'll be nice this week. Then winter will come and it'll really get nice. Okay, I think that's all the announcements. Now what's going on on our prayer list? I think most everybody knows if you get their messages. Nelson went in and had his surgery. I don't even know what all they did in there, but 
Uh, he's doing well as far as I know. I've not talked to him. I've talked to Karen a couple times, but she says he's doing well. And um, I don't know how long it takes to recover from that. I've seen Sister Kay out there. I hollered across the parking lot. She heard me, so she must be doing pretty good. <laughs> what else is going on on our updates on our prayer list, sis? Gary Brown? Okay. Let's put the Brown family on the right ends. Yes, ma'am? Put uh, Mary Jervis on tra on right ends for traveling. Do we already have Jim McAfee on here? <laughs> now, what else he going to have? So I can get it wrote down again. Heart cath. Heart cath. Okay. Jim McAfee, let's go ahead and put him on the sick list because it'll probably be a while before we figure out what's going on. Jim McAfee. Now here's how you know when you're in really in bad shape. If you start to write McAfee and you look down and you've got McDonald you know you've been there to me. I didn't do that. I just wanted to see if anybody else had a red face when that happened. So. <laughs> you know, uh, there's many days I go through there and pick up three chocolate chip cookies with a sandwich or something. But there was a day this week that I was just driving through town and out, out come a whole platter, a whole plate of chocolate chip cookies. And the kind person that I am, I let my wife have one. No, she, I, I let her have two or three, but they were fine cookies, and I didn't have to go to McDonald's. In fact, they were much better than the ones at McDonald's, and um, those are just wonderful things. That's the advantage of being a preacher. Sometimes people take pity on you, and they just give you stuff, good stuff like that. You don't know who might have done that, do you? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Rance is home. Well, he was here Sunday for uh, Sunday morning, and uh, he's home. That's all I know about Rance. He's just home, not moving too fast, but he's just, he's okay as far as I know. Everything's all right with him. I haven't heard anything this week. I mean, we, Brother Kylie went and myself went over there and helped him put some rails up so he can get in and out of the, sh the shower and things like that. But uh, yes, ma'am. Well, he was getting around. He walked all the way out to his mailbox and stuff. He's supposed to be walking with a walker. He walks with a cane, and he talks for a while, and eventually he gets tired and said, I'm going to have to go sit down. But, but um, yeah, I think he's getting his strength back. Yes, ma'am? Okay. They're both doing okay, right? And the last one, Mr. Pitts, he's had his last treatment. And I was over and talked to him this week, and he's starting to get his strength back. So as soon as he gets cleared, he'll be able to come back to church and get around people. Yes, 
ma'am? You move next Wednesday to a place in Ohio. Okay. Let's put Rebecca on the right ends. Did you find someone to care for your dog? You have a lead, huh? <laughs> See, if you can't find anyone, you just accidentally drop him off at a place where there's a lot of kids. And once the kids get around him, then mom and dad done lost that battle. But you didn't hear that from me. And that didn't go out on YouTube, I hope. <laughs> We may have to edit tonight's version of this. So, Anything else? Okay, let's turn over to the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 24. Again, we'll come back to our prayer list at the end of the service. 1 Samuel chapter number 24. Start reading there in verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engadi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of, all, out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep goats, sheep coats. I can't say all these words today. He came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he'd cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to, tre to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. Now that's just a short part of his story. Many of you know the, the story. You know how it, uh, how it happened. I'll say some more about it in a minute. But my thought to talking tonight, it's very possible that living in, in this world, and especially in this day, that you could find yourself underneath some ungodly leadership. Yeah, it may, as a child, uh, they, they may find themselves with ungodly parents. And uh, you, as our kids may find themselves, hopefully not here at this school, but they may find themselves sitting in a classroom under a teacher that's ungodly, someone who shouldn't be there. And uh, in the workforce, uh, you may, you're likely sometime find yourself working under a leader or a boss who's uh, not, the, not a person that should be where he's at, an ungodly person. And no doubt there's going to be times when, when your town leaders, at least part of the, the town leaders, and when someone in, in maybe a governor or someone high up or, a, or the president and so on, uh, they're also ungodly leaders. And the question I want to address this evening because I, I hear it a lot and people talk about it a lot. And uh, as I read this this week, some thoughts come to me. But what, what do you do when you're under ungodly authorities? King David here, he's a, he's a mighty warrior, but he's not the king yet. But when he was the king, he was a very mighty warrior. He was a man who exercised what I call kingdom authority. It's authority that was given him by God. And I'll give you a little more description. In fact, let me, I'll, I'll do that now. I wrote down some things here. How many of you is ever in the Army? Oh, we got one over here in the Army. Let's see, let's see how can... And i got to count them now because I forgot. I think it's 13. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 13 levels of leadership in the Army. I didn't know this. I had to look it up. But uh, I'm talking about David was a man uh, who I said he, he lived by principle, not by appearance, but he exercised what I call kingdom authority. It was God's authority given to him. Well, we have what I would call in this instance uh, army authority. 
And uh, if you're in the Army, it, it, you start off, you're a private. That's as low as you can get. And uh, that's, that's where a lot, of, a lot of folks are. They need a lot of privates. But I thought, and, and I, when I went through all these, I, let's, see if you can, let's see if Kermit will know this. Which is, um, which is a higher ranking, Sergeant First Class or First Sergeant? Okay, first sergeant. See, now, I read that. I didn't, it, to me, they almost sound like the same thing, but it's not. But you, there's private, then there's private second class, private first class, there's specialist, then corporal, sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, master sergeant, first sergeant, sergeant major, command sergeant major, then sergeant major of the Army. That's a lot of levels of authority. But that's what I would call Army authority. Well, David operated under what I call kingdom authority. It was authority given to him by God. Now, my whole thought today that we're headed to is, what do you do when, you're, when the people above you is no good? What do you do when it's, it's awful authority? And, um, and so at, think about David. I, I think about this story sometimes. David, as a boy, not a man, not, not someone who'd been trained, not someone who'd been to the end of the story. As a boy, he killed a bear. I remember when I killed my first squirrel. I thought I'd really conquered the world. But that squirrel wasn't trying to kill me. When I killed him, he was just running up a tree, and I shot at him. And, uh, but he killed a bear. He killed a lion. And still, while he was a boy, he killed Goliath. He wasn't a, a man yet. He was still a boy. And later, as king, David went from one victory to another. In fact, the best I can tell from reading the Bible, David never lost a battle. He, they, there was never a battle that David entered into that he'd come home a loser. That, you can't say that about very many, but the greatest victory that David ever won was not over somebody else. It was over himself. Because one day in a cave, he learned a lesson that I want to try to get across to us tonight, if I can use that phrase, kingdom authority. Uh, he learned that to have kingdom authority, have the authority that God give us, that you're to be over this and you're to be over this, you have to remain under the authority that he's put you under. And David knew that. Let me try and explain what I mean. It is not God's plan for you and I who are saved to be defeated by the world. I'm not talking about the planet out here. I'm talking about the system out here that says you can live without God. You don't need God. We can, we can operate in our own, in our own abilities. Not, it, we should not get in that system and be defeated by it. God's never intended for that to be uh, to defeat us. He never intended for our old flesh, our old desires of the old nature. He never intended for that to defeat us. And he never intended for Satan to defeat us. They're our enemies. Those are things that God, when Christ died and he rose again and you and I accepted him as our Savior, he gave us authority over those things. There's no Christian that can say, I could not help it. I just, it, it was too strong. The, this was too much for me. Satan overcome me. Satan was stronger. He, no, no, nobody has that reason because God said, I can give you authority over all those things. But we will never be over those things that God implants for us, that God has put under us, unless or until we're willing to get under and stay under the things that God's put over us. Because a lot of God's people get out of, we get out of sorts. We don't. I would, uh, and I will have to say I'm probably guilty of this also. You really, we don't really like peop, anybody above us. We don't like answering to anybody. Even when you're a kid, you don't like have, you don't like to have to, to answer to people. You, you want to have, you want to be your own boss. You want to do those things. And, and here in, in 1 Samuel 24, David's hiding from Saul, who happens to be the current king of Israel. And although he's a very unworthy king, he is the king. God appointed him. God anointed him. And so what happens is Saul learns that he's going to be replaced and David's going to be on the throne. And so David becomes uh, his enemy, yeah, public enemy number one. And he sees David as a rising star and he sees his own son kind of in a setting and, and he doesn't like that. And so he, he, you can read several places there where he got into a rage, but he kind of stewing with anger and with jealousy and all that. And, and his, his ambition focused nearly his whole kingdom to go find David and kill him. God said he's going to... Now think about this. Well, who's he fighting against? God said David's going to rule. Saul said, I'm going to kill David. What's he saying? I'm going to fight against God. I'm going to change God's plan. I'm going to do better than God. And so 
And so he takes these 3,000 men. We read a little bit about it there. And they go after David. And, and there's David and his men. They're hiding in a cave and Saul goes in. Well, now if you've ever been in a dark place, you know when you first walk in, it doesn't matter how light it might really be. It's really dark when you come in from out and it's light. So he goes in the cave and there's David and his men. They can see him come in, but he can't see them. And, uh, and I can hear them, and, and this is, the Bible doesn't say this is what they say, but I, I kind of picture them over there whispering to each other, David, this is it. I mean, you've got, this is your, this one sword strike, and it's goodbye to hiding in these caves. I mean, hello riches, and hello honor, and, and, uh, and power, and authority. You're going to be the next king. God's already said it. Go take care of this. And so sword in hand, David goes over in the darkness, and he cuts the hem of his robe off. And that's how close he got. But... He wouldn't kill Saul. He just wouldn't do it. And after Saul goes out of the cave and gets his distance away, you can read the rest of the story. Now, again, I don't know how David, how exactly how it looked. I don't know what his voice sounded like, but I know what I mind would have sounded like. He comes out of the cave. Hey, Saul, <laughs> look what I got here. Guess what I could have done just a few minutes ago when you was wandering around over here in this cave. And, and he lets it, but uh, he refused to execute vengeance. And that day, David won a victory, not over Saul, but over himself. Proverbs 16 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. He practiced what the Bible talks about in the, in the book of Romans. It says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. David gained a great victory on this day. Now, in the day we live, the sad thing is most Christians are in the cult of what I call the cult of self-realization. That's where I've got all the answers. We don't need a preacher. I still remember a lady telling me this just a few years back, and, and uh, she's a nice lady, and, and, but, and I, I would say she didn't think about what she was saying, but I think she did think about what she was saying, but she had disagreed with something I preached on, and I didn't it wasn't an opinion. It was just, I was just reading what the Bible said, and I told her this is what, the, this is what God says. And, and she told me a couple days later, or maybe uh, that afternoon, I don't remember, but she talked to me about it. She said, well, I, you're just a man, and everybody's entitled to his opinion. You see, she was, she was suffering from, from this cult of self-realization where all, you, I got all the answers I need for myself. I don't need somebody telling me something. I don't, need, I don't need nobody telling me this is what the Bible says. I don't care what the Bible says. This is what I'm going to do. And in our generation today is what I call the selfaholics. We're pickled with ourselves. We're centered with ourselves. We're preoccupied with ourselves. We're dedicated to self. But you know, when I read the Bible, the Bible says this about self. Let's be self-surrendering. Jesus submitted himself to the Father. He was equal with God, but he submitted himself. And, and uh, when we're self-surrendering, that means all the answers are not with me. All the answers are in Christ. And I'm going to let him come up with the answers. And so Jesus said this. He said in the last days, he said, because iniquity shall abound. So because there's so much sin in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, you can go back 100 years and you say, well, that was true 100 years ago. But what was it like 100 years ago compared to today? Much worse. Everything gets worse in degrees. We see it today in our streets. We see it in our homes. We see it in our churches. There's never been a day like today when kids rebel against their parents. Now, have kids always done that? Sure, but not like they are today. Uh, churches, a lot of churches today, they just operate under the spirit of rebellion. That's not what God intended. And there's, there's uh, what I call them um, so-called theologians and arrogant teachers and, and leaders out there. They're, they're revising the Bible all the time to make it politically correct. Where's all that come from? Straight from Satan. He's trying to rule over us. But God said, you don't have to let him rule over us. We're over him. And so what do I do when I'm facing with all this ungodly authority? And so here's, and, and that's where David was. He, he had a king over him. That king was no good. And, and be honest with you, I think if I knew I was going to be the next king and I had a chance to kill him, I'd say, well, this must be what God's opening a door. So he was walking pretty close to God not to make that mistake. And so he, I would say, I would say we, we do need to do these things tonight. First, we have to recognize kingdom authority. If I'm facing 
ungodly authority. I have to recognize is this kingdom authority. What do I mean by that? Well, even though Saul was unworthy, even though he was not a good king anymore, even though he was all these things, he was still the king. And David knew that. In fact, later David had another opportunity to kill Saul, and he told one of his fighting men there, he said, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? So here, I guess here would be the question, how do I recognize kingdom authority? How do I know if these people are there because God said it's okay or God put them there or if they're, they're disobeying God? But I, myself, now I, I know some preachers. I got some good friends who are preachers. They just, I guess, uh, I guess they believe you can't get out of the will of God. Everything that happens is God's will. That's not true. Everything that happens, God will use and still fulfill his will. But if I can disobey God and do things wrong, so how do I know if someone's in kingdom authority? Well, Romans chapter 13, if you want, you can turn there. If not, I'm going to read a few verses from Romans chapter 13. But starting there in verse 1, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God for thee to good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now, you read that and you almost think, okay, God says everybody is a good person. No, he didn't say that. He said, I put, I put him there for a reason. Uh, Saul was not a good person. Now, he was pretty good when he started, but he wasn't here. There was a lot of other kings. Ahab was king, but he wasn't a good king. I don't think he ever was a good king. And, and so a lot of those, so what should, what should all these people done with them? Well, that's, that's my first thought. We have to recognize, are they there? Are they, is it kingdom authority? Is they, are they where they are to be or something wrong here? And, and maybe you might feel like David's friend said, hey, man, you've got a chance to get him. Let's get him. And uh, that's, sort of what our, that's sort of the way we live in this country. You've got a chance to get him. Let's tear him. Let's destroy him. And, but David, he kind of humbly said this. No, he said, God sets up kings and God takes kings down and I'm going to be subject to the authorities that God put over me. Um, now, when I say that, people get the wrong idea, and automatically someone will say, well, just wait a second, preacher. Uh, maybe you don't know the kind of government we have. And that, my answer to that would be, maybe you don't know the government that was in power when Paul woke, wrote Romans. Because the fellow in charge was a fellow named Nero. And there's probably not too many people out of their mind a little any farther than Nero was, and uh, a very wicked, very no good leader. In fact, you can read about him sometime. We're not going to go into that. So, so what if I have an awful authority? What if? What do I do? A teen might say, preacher, what if? What if my parents are unworthy? Because a lot of parents are. Or maybe a wife said, what about my? What if my husband's unworthy? Or or people people in general say, what about? What if the president's unworthy? What if the mayor's unworthy? What do I do? Well, here's what you don't do. You don't have a spirit of rebellion. David didn't have a spirit of rebellion. You remember the story we, we, uh, we talked about in Daniel there when Daniel was taken captive and they said, you're going to do all that. Now, all of those things that they told him to do was against what Daniel believed. But Daniel didn't go and say, well, you can beat me if you want, but I'm not going to do that. No, he went in with submission. He went in and talked to him. He was not going to do it, but he went in uh, submissive, he went in uh, humble, without a spirit of rebellion, and he talked with them, and, and they made a deal, and, it, and God worked in his favor. So uh, there was, if, if you remember, there was a time when Samuel told Saul to do something. Now Samuel was not saying, hey, I'm Samuel, you do this. Samuel was speaking for God. And through, through Samuel, God told uh, Saul to do something. Well, Saul didn't do it. And then he even lied about it, and Samuel rebuked him with these words. He said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, when you read the story there of David and you read the story of Saul, what I find out in one place, it even says that David was a man after God's own heart. That is very true. And also is true was Saul was a man after the devil's own heart. Because that's, a, that's the direction he, he took. He had the spirit of rebellion. 
David had the spirit of submission. We're never more like Satan than when we're a rebel. And we're never more like Christ than when we submit. Now, that does not mean that I approve of everything, and you should approve of everything that authorities do, any more than David approved of what Saul did. David didn't say, Saul, you're doing right. I mean, you're doing the best. No, he didn't do that. Saul was very wrong, but David did still understood the principle of being under authority. Therefore, because of that, and because David followed that, when David was a ruler, he was much better. Uh, he, with great, he ruled with great power and great authority because he understood how God put things in order. He understood kingdom authority. And that's the first thing we have to do is recognize kingdom authority. But then we have to also not just recognize it, we have to respect it. That's a little more difficult. Uh, even though Saul was unworthy, David recognized that he was king and he respected him as king. Um, he spoke to Saul respectfully, but he did not give in to Saul's wicked ways. They, it's sort of like he's saying, I'm going to trust God to get me through this and get me out of this, because that's all he could do. That's, all, that's the place where he was. And, but this is the hard part, and this is where we struggle in the day we live today. It's one thing to grudgingly obey authority. Uh, it's another thing to respect authority. Uh, I told a man this week, he was, we, he was asking me some questions about different things, and I, and I told him, I said, well, uh, he asked me my personal opinion on some things. I said, well, I, I said, I'll just tell you, I, I do not feel that our current president has done anything to help our country whatsoever. I said, that's just my opinion of him. I don't like the things he stands for. I don't like the things he pushes. But if he was to come to our service, we would treat him as he is the president. He would get the highest of respect, the highest of honor. Uh, we would show respect for him. We would show respect for the office because God put him there. And, and sometimes kids have parents and, and I say this when I say kids, but I, I'm talk, in my mind right now, I'm, there's people that I've uh, talked with that uh, they're not too far from my age, but they despise their parents because their parents have done some things and been, in wrong, uh, uh, been wrong. And, and, and I can't get this across to them. The one person in particular that my, is coming to my mind, they were real quick to tell me, my parents do not deserve respect. And my answer to them is respect them anyhow because the Bible says so. Uh, I don't deserve forgiveness, but I get it anyhow. And, uh, and when, when I, when I uh, forgive others, I don't do it because they deserve it. I do it because of the forgiveness of Christ. And, and, so, and so if you have parents that don't deserve respect, respect them anyhow. And I would tell kids, if you have teachers that don't deserve respect, respect them anyhow. Make it a, a, a manner anyway, a respectful, treat them in a, a respectful manner. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, if, you, if you're in a church and the pastor doesn't re deserve respect, and I can name you some places that's happened, uh, be respectful anyhow. If your government does not deserve respect, be respectful anyhow. Uh, now that doesn't mean that we give in to wickedness or that we put approval on the things that's wrong uh, any more than David approved of what Saul was doing here. It just means he treated him with respect because of who he is, because of the position he had. But it was David's submission, and this is kind of hard to, to get in your mind, but it was David's submission and doing things that way that actually brought Saul's kingdom to a stop. Now, how am I going to conquer this world? How am I going to conquer this old flesh that wants the wrong desires? How am I going to conquer Satan that's always doing everything? Well, because I, I submit to God's authority and I can bring them's kingdoms down. I can defeat those kingdoms. Otherwise, I don't. Otherwise, I fall in like everybody else, and I, I think like them, and I do like them. And, and uh, so it's, it's not that we just understand, but we have to live and practice what I call kingdom authority. Now, I, don't, I couldn't come up with a good phrase, so that's the reason I use kingdom authority. But if you don't do that, then you never really understand spiritual authority. Uh, I, we need to teach our kids to behave respectfully, to authority and you can see it doesn't happen today I didn't hear the whole story somewhere yesterday I got part of a story where some somewhere I heard an, an eight-year-old was, was robbing a place I don't know if that's true or not but someone I heard something I just heard the tail end of something about an eight-year-old with a gun trying to rob a place and um, I, don't, I don't know what's going on there but but I thought about this because I remember when I was young I remember a preacher preaching along this line and this stuck to my mind and it probably helped me as we raised our kids but he, he made this statement. He said, when you're sitting around the dinner table, he called it roast preacher. He said, when you have roast preacher for lunch, he said, what do you think your kids are learning? 
and, and I, I cannot tell you how many people I know personally that have done this down through the years, but he says, but I'm thinking right now, if you're sitting around your table, dinner table, and you criticize the policemen, you, you're criticizing pastors, you're criticizing presidents, uh, you're building in your children a spirit of rebellion. And that'll come back to haunt you. Now, you may dislike a lot of things they're doing, but it's just sort of like everything else. And some folks don't believe me, but I've told people this. As far as I can tell, my wife and I have been married almost 45 years. They've never heard us argue out loud and fight. Now, believe it or not, we have, but we've been smart enough never to do it in their presence. Now, I think they probably figured out that we've argued a few times, but the fact is they cannot say, well, you know, Mom and Dad, they just fight all the time. We just didn't do that because I, I could figure, and my wife can figure what that's going to do to them later on. And when you spend your time tearing down people of authority, it comes back on you. And you end up with rebels that you didn't really think you was ever going to have, didn't want to have. And it's not, again, it's not respecting the individual. It's getting yourself under a place of authority and respecting the position that, that they are. It's, it's kingdom authority. So um, when you do that, then God can do things in your life uh, in, a, in an amazing way. I, I can't explain that. I can just tell you that, that that's, that's what he promises. And uh, he wants his people to live under the right authority. We have to stay there. So I have to recognize that authority, and then I have to respect that. And when he sees that you don't have a spirit of rebellion, then he is, he, it's sort of like he kind of infuses in us the power that we can live over the things that we should be living over. And all of a sudden, I'm not defeated by this old desires and old flesh. And temptations don't destroy me all the time. And, and the world and this thinking doesn't take over my mind. And I, can, uh, I don't have to turn on TV and listen to some idiot try to tell me how things ought to be. I can think for myself. I can get in the Word of God and figure things out myself. But if I don't put myself under the authority of God... Then I take all these other authorities, and they, get, they take over, and they're not supposed to. So I, I recognize, if, is this the, the kingdom authority? I respect that kingdom authority. And then, and, uh, I, I, I'll say it this way, we rest in kingdom authority. What do I mean by that? I don't rest in governments or the souls who run the governments. I rest in the Lord. David was kind of ahead of his time. Because he understood what the Spirit of God had Paul write later on in Romans 12. He said, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, that wasn't written before David was there. So it wasn't like that he could say, Well, the Bible says, so I'm not going to go after Saul. That wasn't written. But he knew it because the Spirit of God was living in him, the same one who told Paul to write this later. In verse 20 says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, is that not contrary to our human nature? It is mine. Uh, it, it, it's hard to overcome when someone is... is uh, not so much when someone has said something or done something. Those are not near as hard to forgive. It's when they're still saying and still doing that it's hard to, to work with those things. And, and, uh, but all of this does not mean that we blindly just go out and obey ungodly government, obey ungodly rules. Uh, if you think that I believe that, then, then you're wrong. We exercise submission. But we don't exercise what I call, there's a big word, and I don't even, I don't even know who says, uses that word, but I, I, I say we don't exercise passive acceptance. That means there's things that are wrong, and I can't change them. Homosexuality is wrong. Could I tell you that? But it's legal today. I can't change that. So most churches today accept it and don't say anything about it. I'm not going to do that. It's still wrong in the Bible, so we're still going to teach it's wrong. We're still going to preach it's wrong. Now, I'm not going to build a, a half-hour sermon on it. I think I can throw it in every now and then, let you know uh, what the Word of God says. But... But there's a big word. I'm going to try to say the word because I wrote it down, but I don't even, uh, I, don't, I don't know who started the word, but I found it somewhere. It looked good. It's acquiescence or something along those lines. And, uh, but it just simply means uh, accepting things in a passive way. And here's, here's, the, here's the way I think of it. God's prophets, they, wasn't, they didn't just accept things. Uh, they're in the Old Testament. They preached against wickedness. 
uh, Nathan, he come right after out there to David and said, David, you're the man. Now, we would have said, man, he's the king, he's authority. Just, we just got to accept it. He did what he did. No, preacher said you're wrong. And uh, Elijah, he warned Ahab. And Daniel, he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. And Moses confronted Pharaoh. And if you remember John the Baptist, he had something to say to Herod. Didn't, it cost him his head, but he still stood up there and said it. And, and the sad thing is today, our pulpits become silent and wickedness is everywhere. But people are afraid to say anything. People won't say anything. They think it's the wrong thing to say. And, and, uh, if you, and, and people, they say, well, you can't say anything that you'll, you'll lose your, uh, what they I, some, somehow we don't pay tax. I don't know what that word of before it is. I say, well, if you say anything that's like this, and uh, that is all a scare that they're trying to put in people. Uh, that you preach the truth. It doesn't matter what they threaten you with. They've, they've been threatening the tax churches for years. But uh, don't passively accept what's going on in this world. But like David, you still have, a, have to have a spirit of humility and surrender over ourselves. And that's hard to understand because there's things that we have to live with in this world. But I don't have to live with it and not say anything about it. I have to live with it, but I'm going to let people know it's wrong. And, uh, and I'm going to let them know that we're always going to stand against what's wrong. And, and, and that's and even something as simple as uh, someone was asking me about the Bible. So we use King James Bible here in this church. Uh, if you teach, you, you use a King James Bible. Now, I don't know what you use at home. And I don't know what other people use. And, but we stand for the King James Bible. So I'm always going, I'm always going to let people know that. I don't dislike people that use other Bibles. I don't look down at people who use other Bibles. We're just going to stick with the King James Bible. And, uh, and, and that's what it, we don't just uh, accept that because the majority of churches don't today. So it would be to say, well, we just have to accept. No, we're, just, we're going to go ahead and stand with, with the truth of the way we do things. And so uh, when we get, I think I've thrown in too many things in there in L and 1. It kind of so might get a little confusing. But... We, cannot, we can't just accept things. We, we have to surrender over ourselves. And then when we get under the things that God's put over us, then God can trust us to start bringing those things down that rule the world. And the best way for us to conquer things is to just, just stay where we're supposed to be and stand for what's right. And uh, David's greatest victory, it wasn't killing a bear, wasn't killing a lion, wasn't even killing Goliath. It was that day in the, when he was in the cave, and he said, you know what? I'm going to stay under those, though, those things that God's put over me, and then God will keep the things under me that should be under me. That is a hard thing to do. But when you and I do that, God can still bring down wicked kingdoms today, things that's running this world and destroying this world. Uh, and I thought someone said something along this line, and I thought about this. The church, we are not the master of the state. We're not the servant of the state. We're the conscience of the state. And we preach the truth. And that's our responsibility. We preach the truth. We give them God's truth. And that's how, it, if I, I started to title this sermon, How Do You Behave in a Cave? Because that's, what, that's how you behave in a cave. You're, you, you stick with the truth. You do what's right, and, and no matter what. And, and uh, so you'll never win a victory over self or anything until you very first submit to Christ. Now again, this is a Wednesday night and probably everybody in here is saved, but the fact is if you've never submitted to Christ, you can't win victories over all those other things because they're not under you. They're over you. They're running you. They're controlling you. Uh, first we submit to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Christ himself, and then when you give your heart to him, the Bible says he'll cleanse us, he'll forgive us, and then we learn to submit to the authorities that he's put over us in this world. And by doing that, we also uh, put ourselves over the things that sh we should be over. Uh, I hope that was not too confusing to you. That was actually trying to answer a question someone asked me three or four weeks ago uh, about s similar situations. And, and uh, so I didn't have a good title, but it almost come out how to behave in a cave because it rhymes good. And you'd have stayed awake a little bit longer, but, but it didn't work that well. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. And... Um, if you've got your prayer list, we'll, we'll, let's take a little time to pray over them. And then don't forget, come in tomorrow night if you'd like to help us do some Bibles. I, it may be raining tomorrow anyhow, so you may as well do that. If you've never done them and you don't know what it's like, come on over. You can sit and watch. And if nothing else, you can come over and bring candy. I'll eat the candy and show you how we do it. And, and uh, we, I'm good at that too. So, uh, so come join us at 6 o'clock tomorrow night if you can. And if not, we'll see you on Sunday. Come to a Sunday school class. 
and uh, don't be too nervous about it. You, you won't, it won't be difficult on you. And uh, I will say this, these young men are doing a good job. They enjoy studying, they enjoy teaching, and uh, I enjoy seeing people other people doing things. I enjoy, I enjoy the fact that there's like right now over there, there's a whole bunch of people getting ready for next week's master club uh, with young people. And it's, that's what helps the church to grow when everybody's working, everybody's doing things. And, and I appreciate the fact that uh, people are getting involved and you may not be able to do as much as somebody else, but uh, do your part. And so we, we do appreciate that.